stand as we light the fourth candle of our Advent wreath and sing one verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and then go right into after that our opening hymn, which is What Child Is This? We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and our joy. Um, don't hold your breath. <clears throat> See, you guys know, I used to be a Boy Scout. You got a knife with you. I have another candle. <laughs> That's cheap. <laughs> you always got to be prepared. <laughs> We're ready now. Oh, come thou root of Jack. Okay, friends, we're going to sing What Child Is This? It's number 219 in the hymnal, which I need, and you don't need it. Okay. Let's sing together. This is one of those times of the year we get to sing songs everybody knows. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our king? standing for the reading of the gospel. From the gospel of Luke in the first chapter. In those days Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zachariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. 
Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in, in remembrance of His mercy, according to the promise He made to our ancestors Abraham and to His descendants forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And if you will join with me as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. seated. Our next hymn this morning is uh, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. Let me turn to it very quickly. Infant Holy, Infant Lowly, for He's been a cattle star. Ox and lowing, little knowing, Christ the babe is Lord of Swift are winging, angels singing, no wheels ringing, tidings ringing, Christ the babe is Lord of all. Flocks were sleeping, shepherds keeping, oops, there we go, I'm lost, let's start that second verse over. Flocks were sleeping, shepherds keeping, vigil till the morning's noon, saw the glory story, tidings of a gospel true. Thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praise his voice, greet the morrow, Christ the name was born for you. Friends, as we gather together today to pray, we do want to remember those who live into this holiday season. It's just not a happy time for them. Uh, people have lost loved ones. This is their first Christmas maybe without them. Uh, people in Kentucky and Tennessee don't have a home. Uh, we are so blessed here, but we want to reach out to all of those in need with our prayers. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you humbly. We come with all kinds of feelings. Sometimes we come with fear and trepidation, and sometimes we come with sadness and grief. We know that you're the God of all of those things and in spite of our troubles and our fears and our doubts, it's still your kingdom and you're still God. So today we come to praise you and to celebrate the coming of Christ, lighting more candles on that wreath, bringing more and more light into the world until this coming Friday when the light that changes everything happens. And we have a big celebration about the birth of Christ, but God, we know, and you know, that we know that Christ is already come. He's with us now in our troubles. He's with our country as it has all kinds of issues, some of them related to illnesses and others to discord and inability to get along. But whatever those things are that we're dealing with, God, you're still with us, you're still guiding us, and you're still directing us. So today we call on you to remind us that you've called us to be ministers of the gospel, to spread the joy of Christ into the world, especially during this 
season of Christmas. Remind us time and time again that you gave us the gift of today and now we have the chance to give you the gift of our service. Gently nudge us when you need to. Forgive us for the times we fall short. And help us praise the day that the birth of Christ is celebrated as well as we praise his ministry. The way that he showed us compassion and mercy and grace. And the way that he taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we're going to now sing While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks as we prepare to hear the message this morning. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angel of the Lord came down, and glory shone around, and glory shone around. Fear not, said he, for mighty dread. Hebrews in the 10th chapter. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, See, God, I have come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. They added, see, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. 
And it is by God's will that we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So I entitled this message, Sanctified, It's God's Will. Now, sanctified is a little bit of a confusing word, I guess, to some folk. John Wesley used it in a different way than other people. Some people look at that as one of those people that think they're better than others. You know, that's not really the way that Wesley used it. He understood God's grace to come in three forms. Provenient grace is the grace that happens in your life from the time that you're knitted together in your mother's womb until you realize that God has had a place for you in his kingdom. You didn't know about it. You didn't think about it. You didn't worry about it. But God was protecting you. And I'm sure everybody in this room can right now think of some instances where something could have gone a different way and they wouldn't be here today. So that's provenient grace, the grace that happens. It, the word that Wesley really used was preventing grace, which is like, you know, you go to the dentist to get your teeth cleaned so that you don't get cavities. And so preventing grace is the grace that works at you so you don't end up being consumed by sin. Justifying grace is that grace that happens the day that you realized it. Maybe it wasn't the first time you realized it, but it's that day when, when something happened in your life and you, you went down the aisle and you gave your life to Christ or you got baptized. Or if you were baptized as an infant, it's that day when you grew up and you realized or accepted what had happened to you. It's that day when God's will and your will cross over and they line up. And so you can look around and say, yeah, uh, God, you did it. You're the one that got me here today. And for many Christians, that's enough. They're happy just to be there. But that's not the way that this scripture talks about it. We're being sanctified by the gift of the body of Jesus Christ. In other words, we've now been given a chance to do something more than just believe, but to act upon our beliefs and become living disciples, if you will, of Jesus Christ to go out in the world and do good stuff. Another way to say it is if your head knows it and your heart knows it, then your hands and feet got to show it somehow. And so I think it, it's always an interesting thing to think about that. But as I began to think about this week and where we are in Advent, the fourth Sunday of Advent, and, and all the stuff that's going on in the world, and the reason that I know people that don't attend a church service or that don't believe that they need to attend a church service, I began to understand something about this particular passage. He's referring to the law. You remember that's what happened, the Ten Commandments. And then the Jews wanted to be more specific so you wouldn't break any Ten Commandments. They brought, they made 613 other laws so that you couldn't get close to the Ten. And Jesus comes along and he says, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. And the greatest two commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now I want to tell you, if you do those two, you're going to have a hard time breaking any of the Ten. Jesus simplified it significantly. But the reality is that people think they have gone so far down the wrong path. They've done so much stuff. Their, their life is such a failure that it doesn't apply to them. And I think that's exactly why the writer of Hebrews put that in there the way he did. I, I entitled last night's message on the same scripture. The past is the past. Jesus is not concerned with all the stuff that got you to hear. He's concerned with what you're going to do when you go from this place forward. Amen. It doesn't matter who you were. We get so encumbered by all the stuff we've done wrong that we forget that God came to save us from ourselves. And we need to let go of that. You know, in AA, they have a simple saying that says, let go and let God. It's easier said than done. Let me just tell you. But we need to let go of what we were and be willing to become what God wants us to be. There was a guy in the, back in the 80s named John Bradshaw that did a lot of family systems talks. And he frequently used these words. He said the saddest thing in, in the planet was for somebody to go to their grave with their music unplayed. And so the challenge we have is what's our music? How do we play it? What do we do? And, and so many of us think, well, uh, you know, even churches, the whole church can get caught up with this. We've tried that before. Or we've always done it this way. 
And the reality is, friends, every day is a new day. Every day is a new opportunity. As one of my friends says every time I see him, he says, it's the best day of my life. It is the only day of your life. What happened yesterday is gone. What's going to happen tomorrow is not yet revealed. What we have today is to do everything we can to make it the very best possible day we can. And Jesus would say, you do that by remembering that it's the Lord your God that put you into this planet, that woke you up this morning, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you do that, you'll not only have a good day, but you'll probably make an impression on the world. And I think, I, I just, I watched a movie yesterday that, uh, I'm really not a great movie reviewer because I watch movies you shouldn't watch. Uh, I don't ever want to refer movies, people to movies because some of them have language and ideas that you don't want to follow. I just watch movies because they're on. But this one has uh, Sandra Bullock in it. It's called Unforgiving. And it's, I'm not going to spill the candy in the lobby. I'm not going to tell you all about it. But, uh, but she has been to prison. And as she got out of prison, for whatever she was in prison for, everywhere she went, even her parole officer told her, you're always going to be always going to be an enemy. And, and to me, that's just so incredibly sad. And, and, you know, in contrast to that, think about Charles Colson, who got arrested and, and went to prison after Watergate, remember? And while he was in prison, he, he looked around and he said, these people need Jesus. And so he created the prison ministries. Now look, I'm not telling you that God made him sin and be violated and go to jail and all that stuff so that he could create prison ministries, but God took him in the circumstance where he was and created something that's making a difference. It'll make a difference for 49 kids out of this church today. So it doesn't matter what the circumstances were that God you were, you were the, the choice is what are you going to do with it then? And I, I have to tell you that in the movie, Sandra Bullock is persistent. And, and at the end of the movie, she does get redemption. I'll tell you that much. Not the way you might expect. But isn't that really our prayer all the time is for redemption? Are, are we really hoping to be re rescued from ourselves, from all the stuff we did? I mean, I, I don't know. In, in AA, they have a thing on the fourth step where you list all the stuff you ever did wrong. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's an interesting thought. My experience was it was every time you made the list and you thought you were done, you thought of some more stuff. I mean, there's a big, long list of stuff that, that we've done. We, we, we all have hurt somebody. We all have been inadequate in some relationship. We all have done something that wasn't as good as it could have been. And some of it was out of ignorance and some of it was out of carelessness. It doesn't matter the reason. Sometimes we get caught up in that reason, you know. It, it's just like, you know, a person that won't read is no better than somebody that can't read. You're not reading either way. And so we, we have an opportunity to take our lives and figure out and do some assessing and say, okay, I want to be different tomorrow than I was today. In, in my, my own experience, you know, I can tell you that uh, change doesn't come suddenly. <laughs> Sometimes it's so incremental you can't feel the difference. But then you'll run into somebody and they'll say, oh, you know, what happened to you? You know, you seem at peace, you seem happier. We forget sometimes that that peace of Christ that surpasses understanding is not the same as the peace that the world offers. It's not peace that says all your bills are paid and you got all the money you need and you got everything you want. That's not the kind of peace the Bible talks about. It's the kind of peace where you know you have the assurance that no matter what happens, God will be with you. And I think that's the challenge that we people suffer is we're, because we're human beings and we live in this world where there's just all kinds of stuff. You know, we've got, we've got political stuff going on, right? And there's some of that. And then there's economic stuff going on. And, and it's so easy to get caught up and say, well, I just can't. <laughs> my dad, my dad was a great guy. But he was not a person that would allow you to be a quitter. Um, his favorite thing when I was little and as I grew up, when I'd say I can't, he said, can't, never did nothing. And I really think that's the message here that God's trying to say, maybe according to the law, maybe according to the rules and regulations, or even your initial expectations, your life isn't today what you thought it was going to be. 
But you have an opportunity to make it what God wants it to be tomorrow. You know, what happened then is gone. Whatever it was. You know, been divorced. Yeah, there's a lot of us have been. Is that a good thing? No. We wish nobody would get divorced. Kathy and I went to a, to a wedding anniversary party yesterday for a couple who've been married 67 years. I admire that. And I'm grateful for the friends that I have that have those relationships. My mom and dad were married 58 years. Ron and Maxine, 58 years. Lots of people. Marriages are great. But we have to be careful not to pigeonhole or categorize somebody because theirs wasn't. So many times we want to put a label or a name. I want to tell you, friends, don't become what you're not. And don't be held into, cap into captivity by what you used to be. I struggled with that for years when people would, would, would go places and they want to know, you know what your name is and, and, and who are you. I, I, having a self-identity was something that it took me a long time to figure out exactly who I was. And maybe that's the thing that, that more, more of a struggle about than we ever knew. Who, who really am I? It's not, you're not a human doing, right? You know, you're not the president of this or the, uh, the custodian of this place or the operator at that refinery or the project manager over there. You're a person created by God to do something in God's kingdom. And I just can't tell you what it is. We're going to figure it out. And as we do, we'll make this beautiful music, which Ann would tell you, you know, and we've done this before, but she can play notes on the piano. They sound kind of all alone until you start playing the chord. Or you play a lot of notes. And, and what happens is we get harmony. And harmony happens when some people sing low and some people sing high and some people sing better than others. And we put it all together and it has a beautiful sound. And that's the way the church is supposed to respond to the chaos of the world. Everybody doesn't need to know every verse of the Bible. They just don't. It's good if you know where one is and you can look it up. <laughs> but you don't have to memorize every verse. What you do need to know is that this has instructions for you in how to build relationships. And they're in those words I gave you just a few minutes ago. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you do that, friends, you're well on the way. To doing the stuff God calls you to do. <laughs> it's funny sometimes to, to talk to people of what they think about those things. You know, there are people out there that think it's all, it doesn't matter what you do. It matters what you do and it matters who you do it with. And the problem sometimes we have, especially I think nowadays, is we're not aware of the things we do that hurt others. They call it systemic racism and systemic other things and we all have it i mean we just do you, know, you grow up in a family with primary process and that family does the way it does i'll give you a really really serious life-threatening example we had these these friends that hadn't been married too long and so they invited us over to their house with a bunch of other people to have hot dogs and so they were in the kitchen getting ready to have the hot dogs and one of them was taking a pot, put it on the stove to put the weenies in the boil of water, and the other one was putting the hot dogs in the bun to put them in the oven. And so they looked at the other and said, what are you doing? So, well, I'm cooking the hot dogs. No, I'm cooking the hot dogs. Well, this is the right way. No, this is the right way. As far as I know, they're both the right way. But they were, it was a pretty good fight <laughs> before it was over because that's the way they learned how to do it. That's what they knew how to do. Are you open to some new stuff? Because i got to tell you, what God has in store for you is totally different than what you learned. I mean, we learned good stuff from our parents, but they didn't fulfill all the gaps that we need. They didn't tell us how to deal with stuff. At least mine didn't. Mine have been dead more than 20 years. The stuff that's happening is new. How do you deal with people that are irate? I had kin folks all of my life that didn't agree politically, and we all, after they got done arguing, they'd sit down and hold hands, pray, and eat Thanksgiving dinner together. Uh, you know, we were talking last night. You realize it's a little late now, but if you'd have just talked about politics at Thanksgiving, you'd have a lot smaller Christmas list this year. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
Uh, I mean, we're, we're really caught up in this stuff, and we need to, that's, that's, that stuff's stuff, man. But I want to tell you, as, as I think it was uh, Augustine said, you know, that stuff is potentially going to be gone, but God's kingdom's still going to be here. Which one do you want to be caught up in? You know, you want to take a side on some of these things. I don't want to be identified as a person this or a person that. I want to be identified as Jack, a child of God. And it's a safer place to be. And you still get invited to dinner. That was supposed to be kind of funny. It's okay if you laugh. At The past is the past. Sanctified is what God wants. God is drawing us closer. It does get confusing. We celebrate the birth of Christ, but yet we know Christ already came. Well, yeah, we do. We know He already came, but have we understood the value of His coming to our lives? It dawned on me a few years ago as I look out and today it's, it's maybe different because we have a small crowd, but I, I look out in the audience sometimes. There's people there I don't always know. And my assumption for years was, well, you know, if they came to church, they know who Jesus is. They know what it's all about. They know the whole story. But you know, there's people out there that don't. First time for me, I ever preached a sermon, and at the end of the sermon, I said what well, we always say, you know, if today be the day you do not go to church, this lady came up and said, oh my God, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I don't know what to do. I thought that was just something you said at the end of the service. I, how could anything have I said? And it wasn't anything I did. It was the Spirit moved her. I want to tell you, friends, the Spirit is moving the church today in a way that it hadn't moved it in my lifetime. We have opportunities today that we haven't had in my lifetime. There are a lot of people out there that aren't going to church anywhere because of COVID. There's a lot of people out there that aren't doing anything. I've got friends that have not eaten out in two years. I've got friends that absolutely are doing everything by online shopping. They are not going to stores. I don't know how they do that. I, I really kind of agree with somebody I heard on the news Yesterday, I think his name is Michael Smirconis or something. I, you know, there'll probably be a day when I get COVID, but I'm not going to let it control my life. <clears throat> Jesus has given us the opportunity. I mean, I'm vaccinated. That's all I can do, right? And if I get it, they tell me I probably won't die. That's a good thing. Now, I'm not going to go intentionally try to get it, but I'm not going to not go anyplace. I'm not going to not go see you if you're sick or something else just because I might get sick. I'm not going to not show up here at church and do what we need to do and sing these great hymns of the church just because I might get sick. And I don't want you to either. In fact, I'll give you a heads up. Christmas Eve, we're going to use real bread for communion. We're not using those little wafers anymore. It's just time to move on. And we need to pray and we need to do the best we can to be safe, but we need to live our lives because we can't do the work of Jesus Christ hollered up in a little hole somewhere. We've got people out there that need to know. This afternoon, there's going to be people driving down this road and Santa Claus is going to be sitting out there and there's going to be people that don't know why and they're going to stop. We're going to have an opportunity for people to see us doing some of God's work right here in this community. But that's true every Sunday. It's true every time a visitor comes in, we haven't seen them before. It's true every time we do anything here, the doors are open wide. The United Methodist Church has the most wide open doorways into the Christian world of any denomination or non-denominational group. We have the least qualifying rules. We have the least restrictions. When we do communion, we invite everybody to come. This is a wide open doorway into the community of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we are the stewards of that doorway. And if you're caught up and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I just, I'm so sad. Or, or my day had not been good. I don't have enough money. I just can't give what those other people, it's not any of it about that. You remember in the scriptures, it talks about the widow. She gave two pennies. That was more than the rich guy that was standing over there. You need to give your time, treasure, and talent to the kingdom. It is not proportional. You do what you can. 
And when we get it at the church, we're going to be careful and frugal and do everything we can so that God can do whatever God wants to do out of this community of faith. So I'm hopeful. How about you? I'm excited about Christmas this year. Not because I'm going to get a gift. I, I may not. I kind of get gifts whenever I want them. You know, everybody in my family kind of get gifts whenever they want them. But I am going to get the gift of seeing family and friends. You guys, I get to hang out with y'all. What a deal. Years ago, a long time ago now, when we had a pool table back in the back, a friend of mine was here. We were shooting pool, and I guess I was doing pastoral counseling of sort. You know, he shot, and I shot, he shot, and I shot. He said, did, you, did I ever tell you about being in prison? And I said, no, but it's your shot. <laughs> you don't want to know? I said, I don't need to know. Because the person I know is the person I know that I met, that I've had a relationship with, and it doesn't matter to me what got you there. You're past that. You've paid that dues. It's done. Let's move on. And I think that's the reason the church is the church. We are a place people get second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And if you start thinking that's a few too many, remember what Jesus says when Paul asked him or when Peter asked him, how many times do I forgive? He says, what was it? 60 times 7? 70 times 7? Depending on what version you read, 777 times 7? Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. I'm not telling you, if somebody embezzles stuff, you don't necessarily put them working with the money. Okay? But it doesn't mean you have to disown them and never talk to them again because they need redemption just like I do. In their sins, they may be more visible, they may be more knowable, may, more people may have seen them, but let me tell you, I got some too. And I'm thankful for our Savior Jesus Christ that forgives them in spite of me. And if you don't, haven't heard that lately, let me just remind you, friends, you too are forgiven. You've been forgiven. You've been given the opportunity to do life. Sometimes I like Wesley's little notes. Faith was one of the most important theological concepts for John Wesley. It's also complex. Over time, Wesley came to think of faith in different ways. Early on, he thought it was believing in the truth of the Christian revelation. He never really gave up that idea, but through his own experience and by the grace of God, he realized that faith also involves trust and confidence. And in fact, having this trust in God became so important to him that eventually he began to consider faith as the evidence of God's love that could secure our trust and confidence because faith can have different dimensions. Wesley began to talk of degrees of faith and indicate how people could grow in the way they grasp the meaning of God's love for them. The highest degree of faith was coupled with such assurance of God's love that a person was completely filled with love in return. Yeah, if you ever watch the Wesley movie with this, Wesley himself Started off early on in his life. He had to go visit the imprisoned to do the other stuff because he wanted to earn his way to heaven. And then one day he went to a meeting he didn't want to go to, to be with some people he didn't really care for, to hear something he already knew, read by somebody that wasn't his favorite. Somebody was reading the preface to Romans by Martin Luther. And at that moment, he had a strange heart. His heart was strangely warm. He had a heartwarming experience. And he knew that Jesus Christ died for him. That's what I want you to know today, friends, all of you. Jesus Christ died for you. The past is the past. He's taken care of that. The question is, what will we do with the future? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what we're going to do now with the future is sing. That's okay. That's a good thing. Yeah, we're going to sing good Christian friends rejoice. 
If you're able and willing, would you please stand? If, the, if today would be the day that you would unite with our church, come forward as we sing. Good Christian, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. News, news, Jesus Christ is today. Friends, I hope everybody stays safe. Um, stay out of the traffic. Do everything you can to be safe. Hope to see a lot of you Christmas Eve at 11 and then uh, next Saturday at 5.30 or Sunday at 11. Have a really good week. Just know that God came to create all of this stuff. And God made us to be important parts of this. And now the Holy Spirit sends us forth to take the light of Christ into the world. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.